Danny. It is so nice to have you on She Leads. I am so excited to just get to know you, learn from you, and just hear your story. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. I love this initiative that you're taking. Course, thank you. So I'm honored to be hosted. Thanks. So Danny, you are the Senior Director of Sales at Slack. And most people have probably already heard of Slack, but just in case, it is probably one of the fastest growing companies today. And what you guys do is you enable teams to communicate and collaborate effectively. And even given these times with coronavirus, I'm sure it's even more useful. Um, but prior to Slack, you got your bachelor's from UPenn, you went to Stanford Business School, and then you also have experience in management consulting, and you worked at HubSpot for five years as director of product. So Danny, it's just, it's so exciting to have you here, and I'm really going to learn a lot, so I'm excited. Um, but just to get started, I want to take you back kind of to when you were my age, 21, 22 years old, coming out of UPenn. Did you know what you wanted to do? And if not, like, how did you navigate your career? I had zero idea what I wanted to do. Yeah. And frankly, I'm okay with that now in hindsight. So anyone who's listening, you know, breathe a sigh of relief and feel rest assured you're going to be fine. Okay. Um, I studied psychology undergrad, and that was definitely where my curiosity took me and where a lot of my interests lied. Um and I thought about actually pursuing that as a career path. Like, what would it look like to become a therapist? And what I realized was, um, I think that profession um, benefits from gray hair, metaphorical and literal, and just life wisdom and experience. Yeah. Um, and I also needed to uh, make sure that I was able to support myself right away. I didn't want to go straight into getting another degree. Yeah. And so then I was thinking about the business world and was thinking, well, that's one where actually my, my youth may help me. And it, mm. it would probably be easier to build a career in business first, whatever that means. It's a pretty broad term. Mm. And then later in life, over time, if I want to, I could go and, and start a therapy practice or revisit my mm. passion for psychology. And, um, in fact, waiting a long time would actually help me show up better in that role. Yeah. So that was kind of how I navigated it. And, and I jumped into the business world mostly through trial and error and, you know, taking the job I was hired for. Yeah. Yeah. And so did you have mentors throughout your career kind of guiding you and telling you, okay, this, this could be a really valuable experience or was it kind of just your own, your own outlook? I now have many mentors and I've developed kind of um, a whole roster of mentors, mm -hmm. some of whom I'm, I'm proactive with and we can talk through it a little bit, um, but there are some that I check in with regularly and who know that they're playing a mentorship role. Mm -hmm. And there are others who I just look to in terms of seeing how they navigate um, very specific circumstances where I think they show up well and I try to wear that person's kind of hat and mindset when I'm trying to navigate a similar situation. But early days, like, you know, if I'm in your position, I'm 21, I'm 22. On one hand, I can imagine that you're looking around at your peers and you're, you're trying to make sure that you measure up to whatever they're doing and that you feel like you've gotten the job secured um, so that you know what's next. But on the other hand, you know, looking back, I would say you should absolutely prioritize fun and adventure right now. Like you, you have the rest of your life to figure out, you know, how to navigate your career and make sure every step is productive. Uh, but you'll never have the freedom that you have in your early 20s. Yeah. So, you know, let's say COVID aside, if there's an opportunity to go abroad and just do something that sounds fun or really intellectually stimulating, do that. Do not worry about getting into the perfect rotational program or, you know, even if you're younger and you're 19, like don't worry about getting that perfect internship that's going to lead to the perfect job. There is time. And uh, I definitely just like guessed my way through the early years. And you know what? I was able to make up a really um, intentional sounding story in hindsight where like somehow all the pieces of the puzzle came together and I wouldn't have gotten to where I am now without that. But it's not like it was pre um, scripted or super intentional yeah. along the way. Yeah. And so, yeah. Like, and, I, okay. and I think that's, I think that's so valuable too, especially, 
especially people my age, we kind of get in this, or a lot of people, honestly, like regardless of age, you get into this mindset where, okay, I'm going to plan on my life five years from now, 10 years from now. And even like, for instance, coronavirus right now, it's kind of taught us that, look, you can plan because it's good to plan. But at the end of the day, things change and you have to kind of be flexible with that and just take it as it comes. And also like, yeah, having fun at this age, it's a great lesson for me just because also I think we can learn from every experience we do, regardless of what it is. So like studying abroad or going abroad, I'm sure I'm going to be learning in that experience that I can take to a future job. So I think that's definitely, definitely valuable. And I love that. And it just gets more complicated. Like now, you know, let's say I was craving uh, a six month stint in London. Yeah. That would mean um, thinking through my own career. That would mean impacting my husband's career. That would mean thinking about what it means to relocate an eight and a half, eight and a half month old daughter. So like it just, it gets complicated. Yeah. So I would say in the early days, um, you know, follow your sense of adventure. And then also just like you're doing, um, tap into where your natural curiosity takes yeah. you and let that be your guide. Cause that's like, that's the most telling sense of where you're going to find fulfillment in your career. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So now kind of walk me through, you went to business school and afterwards you went into management consulting. Did you like that? Was that somewhere like what drew you to that and what drew you out of it? Yeah. So I, um, I actually started management consulting right after undergrad Okay. and I went into management consulting because I mean, frankly, it, it was a very common path for um, Penn undergrads to move into management consulting. Mm-hmm. And what it represented to me was business boot camp. Since I was a liberal arts major undergrad, I hadn't really um, deeply gotten an understanding of how businesses operate and grow. And this was a way to get paid while learning that and hopefully provide value to the companies I was consulting. Mm-hmm. And um, I would say it was very valuable, uh, almost two years of my career, but it was not, it was not a natural place for me to continue building my career. And like that, that took a little while for me to figure out. Um, I would say I showed up to work and I wasn't naturally curious about the problems I was solving. I wanted to do a good job and be a really good employee. Mm. Uh, but that was like my first inkling that I might not be in the perfect fit role. And what I learned again, like through trial and error over time is that I thrive when I am working really closely with other people Mm. and my job is really social in nature and when it's customer facing in nature. So rather than just flexing analytical muscles in my brain and, you know, and, and building models alone in an office, I need to be out there and interacting all the time. Yeah. So I'm interested, was this kind of a daily realization where you were like, okay, I need to interact with teams? Like how, how often should we kind of tap into how we're truly feeling? Because I feel like it's easy to get lost in the daily task and be like, maybe, maybe this is just what I'm supposed to be doing right now. It was not a daily realization. Um, I did feel committed to um, sticking with the role for two years in part to, number one, learn what I wanted to learn. Number two, follow through with the commitment I made to the company. Um, And number three, just, um, I guess, just have the discipline of doing something that is hard and and perhaps unnatural Mm -hmm. and building a muscle that will serve me well. So it wasn't like on, on day five, I thought this is hard. It might not be a good fit for me. Mm -hmm. I thought this is hard. It probably means it's worth learning. And I practice, like I started reading the wall street journal every day. I try to open that up for discourse during lunch with people more senior than I to practice speaking intelligibly about what was happening in the business world. Mm -hmm. So it was really valuable. And it wasn't until a year and a half in that I even considered looking elsewhere Mm -hmm. Um, and once I did, I cast a really wide net at the time I didn't have mentors. Like, again, I I was not nearly as proactive as you were so early in my career. And I don't know if I would have had the guts. Like I I only gained this once I entered sales and I realized that people respond to cold emails and cold calls all the time. Um, but until I entered sales, I didn't realize that people are happy to just sit down with you and share what they've learned. And in fact, there's probably, you know, there's a psychological gain on my end to, feel helpful to the next generation. No, definitely. 
So, so when did you discover sales and something where you were like, okay, this is something I'm passionate about. I'm talking to customers directly and working in teams. So when did you discover that? So I discovered it through happenstance, but I do want to urge you and anyone who's listening to consider it more proactively. Mm -hmm. What happened was I stumbled upon HubSpot, which at the time was a teeny tiny company, just above 50 employees and totally fell in love with the company's culture. Like you, you could tell just through the blog content that was written, what kind of a company it was. And then as soon as I interviewed, I applied to a number of roles. And I remember there were different recruiters internally helping me figure out which role was right. And they're like, well, what are you? Are you sales or are you a consultant? Which was what we called customer success. And I was like, I don't know. I just want to work at this company because it feels vibrant and it, and it's exactly what I'm craving right now. Mm. And, um, and what I learned actually in, in hindsight afterward with that, that didn't serve me very well. Um, when a recruiter is talking to a candidate, they want to hear passion for a specific role. Mm. So even if you haven't made up your opinion, like that, I am absolutely born to be in sales or I'm born to be in customer success, mm. get yourself excited about one or the other, maybe, you know, seek mentorship from some folks earlier and, develop a point of view because, um, accidentally I, I probably came off as a little bit wishy-washy. It was like HubSpot's my goal. Yeah. Put me where you want, pay me if you want to. I don't care. I just want to, I want to work here. Um, and then I ended up in sales cause that's where the CEO put me after interviewing with him. And thank goodness I did. Um, I learned that sales is a perfect combination of psychology, which is what I had studied and where my passion was and strategy. So you are constantly trying to get into the mind of the buyer and think about like what matters to them. Like what, um, what can I, to a certain extent, assume about like ways that I can be helpful. And then how do I let their guard down and pressure test some of those assumptions so that I figure out whether this is a good use of time. Yeah. And I would have done that job for free. Like it, it just felt really good to sell something that I think people need. So if you are considering a role in sales, I would say one litmus test that you could use is would I think that any family member who was running a company or any good friend who was running a company would be crazy not to use this product? Mm. Like, do I just deeply believe in what this product does? And, and I really want everyone I know and love to use it. If the answer is yes, you're naturally going to be able to sell it with yeah. a little bit of coaching. If the answer is no, and it's a little bit commoditized, that may not be the right product for you to sell. Like it's, mm. it's not going to feel as natural. Yeah. And I, it's kind of also a test in a sense about the company that you want to go work at. Cause you were so passionate about HubSpot that you really didn't care what role it is. But I think once you were in sales, you already had that passion for it that you were going to succeed in selling it. Um, would you say that's right? I think that is spot on. And yeah. particularly early in your career, actually, no, at any point in your career, um, the company you choose matters far more than the role you choose and certainly more than the title you get or any um, small discrepancies in the compensation that yeah. you're earning. And, you know, this, I'm not the first to give this advice. This is Cheryl Sandberg's advice about um, jumping on the rocket ship, but yeah. I completely believe in that. And it's worth trusting your instincts. So while I was at the management consulting firm, uh, before I applied to HubSpot, I had seen a Craigslist ad for Airbnb that was mm -hmm. called, uh, the, even the website was different. It was Airb and B yeah. at the time. Yeah. And it was advertising this 15 person company that had happy hours on Fridays and a roof deck. And here's what they were doing. So it was kind of like emphasizing culture, which seems starkly different from management consulting. And, um, and I looked at the website and I was like, this just makes so much sense. Why wouldn't you have a much more personal experience when you're traveling? Why wouldn't you automatically make a friend when you're going to a new city? So I wrote them two impassioned, basically like love letters slash applications that completely went unanswered. Um, but I trusted my instinct in terms of like what company value prop resonated with me and where to bet my career. And that would have been a really good bet. Yeah. And then my next one was HubSpot. And thank goodness um, that one got a response back and, and ended up um, allowing me to land a role there. Yeah. And so 
trust your instincts there. It's like, you know, people say um, invest in stocks for companies that, you know, where you use the product and you like it anyway. Um, same goes for, for where you're thinking about navigating your career. Yeah. I love that. I think that's, I think it's so valuable. So before we even get to Slack and kind of your role at Slack and what drew you to Slack, I am interested in HubSpot and its culture because you talk about the culture a lot. So what tangible or what aspects of its culture that really you love? Um, well, you know what? One thing that was great about HubSpot is that um, before there was a trend to do so, the company was very intentional about actually uh, – naming its culture mm-hmm. and using culture as a way to drive how the company makes decisions. Mm-hmm. So Dharmesh, one of the co-founders and the CTO, um, ended up creating a doc that was called HubSpot's Culture Code. Mm-hmm. It was inspired by um, its predecessor, um, Netflix, created something similar. And he actually reached out to me when he was building it and a small handful of other people. And he was really collaborative, which was in part living the culture of HubSpot and turned it into this living and breathing doc that allowed us to really check ourselves um, in the ways that we made decisions. Mm. So one of the elements of the culture was um, use good judgment. And it's so simple, but instead of needing like layers and layers of bureaucracy before you make a decision, that was that was really the, the guideline that was built into the company's culture. And I think that was really liberating for people for right. figuring out, you know, what do I do next or solve for the customer. Um, that's a really simple and straightforward way to guide decision-making. And I think at its best, a company that names its culture and uses that to make it very clear which way to go in a decision is a company that's doing that well. And, and I would say Slack is, is a perfect example of that too. Yeah. So, okay. Great segue to Slack. So what drew you to Slack? How did you just, what, what stage did you join it as well? Cause now it's grown to a much bigger company. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I feel so lucky, um, first of all, that I get to work at Slack and that I joined at the time that I did, although I think um, I think now is a really good time to join too. Um, what drew me to Slack was, it was almost the inverse of what I had experienced at HubSpot. So HubSpot had this sales and marketing machine down pat and over time developed a product that caught up and was able to serve its customers, but it had um, tremendous mind share. Like its blog was just, um, showing up number one, no matter what question you would Google about marketing tips. And yet we had just captured a teeny tiny part of the market share. And so we were transitioning from like a very top down sales process into over time, one that leveraged a freemium model in my final year when I was in product and just looking at what companies were in high growth and I think represent the future of how software will be built and sold. Um, I looked at all of these freemium SaaS companies. I looked at Dropbox. I looked at Zoom. I look at Evernote, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And Slack to me was at the forefront of um, a consumerized enterprise company, meaning like it felt very consumer style in terms of how it's built. You can use it for, you know, playful, um, consumer style use cases. I don't know if you guys use it in Stanford undergrad, but like, uh, in business school, for example, we used it to coordinate rides, um, Mm. from the airport back onto campus, just silly little things like that. But the business model is squarely enterprise, meaning, um, there's no question about whether over time they would need a sales org to help navigate the buying cycle. Uh, for certain companies. So I wanted to um, build my expertise in bottoms up sales rather than just top down, because I think the future will require a combination of the two. And I didn't want to become a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. And also I think, you know, gone are the days where sales gets to pound its chest and um, claim credit for all the revenue driven by a company. I think sales leaders need to be much more humble today and Mm -hmm. acknowledge that if you're at an amazing company, the product is doing the vast majority of the selling. You are just kind of shepherding it into mm-hmm. the right people's hands. You're bringing the right people around the table. You are mm-hmm. answering some security or legal questions, but like you really need to be able to defer to product and you need to, um, you need to constantly be providing feedback over to the product team so that they can in turn, um, 
learn from the front lines and improve the self-service experience more. Yeah. So Slack was the perfect place to be able to do that. And we were really late stage in terms of product market fit when I joined, um, but we were really early stage in terms of building out the go-to market mm. muscle. Um, so yeah. it was perfect. Like I could do the creative building stuff, but uh, it was relatively de-risked from the product market fit. Yeah, that's awesome. That sounds like a very exciting time, especially for someone like you in sales. And also you can use that creativity side. So I'm wondering, so first, how many people, is, how many people in your team that you lead? Sure. I have um, a team of about 80 okay. and um, we're spread across five different geographies, actually more now during COVID yeah. as people retreat to, you know, their family homes in Florida and elsewhere. Yeah. And, um, and that's been a really uh, new challenge for me in terms of widespread remote management, which has been really interesting um, and really fulfilling, frankly. Um, but yeah, we have, uh, I oversee the mid-market and sale and SMB sales org, which is basically like the com- commercial sales practice yeah. and um, a good chunk of our self-service nice. uh, revenue as well. So I'm wondering, how did you develop your leadership style? Like, how did you know whether how to be an effective leader and what tools do you use to kind of ensure that you are being an effective leader for so many different people? Um, I think it's a work in progress. I don't know if my leadership style is, is fully baked. I'm, I'm, I'm a work in progress and I'm evolving as I see people who I admire, who I want to, um, mimic in different scenarios. Mm. So I think the best, um, the best way to operate as a leader is, you know, through the golden rule in part. And I've paid close attention to when do I feel most motivated in my role and what makes me want to over deliver. And I try to exude that in my leadership style. Um, I also really believe in this concept of radical candor, which I'm Mm -hmm. sure you've heard about. Um, But I think there's, there's two parts of that. Um, One is developing a relationship with the people who report to me. Um, that makes it really clear that I am truly rooting for them and that I have their best interest at heart. And I think that takes time and curiosity and follow through. And once that's been established, um, I think constant, really clear, direct communication, especially when we're having hard conversations, like not shying away from hard conversations, has been an important and I hope hallmark part of my leadership style Mm. so that people who work with me feel like they've never grown more in their careers than Mm. when we're working together like that. That to me would be a really great sign of success. If someone says Danny was, uh, Danny was a very caring and a very tough leader. I would love to see the combo of those two or hear the combo of those two. Yeah. I like that. And so Okay, this is kind of off topic, but I'm very interested in it in terms of sales. So I took this class. It was entrepreneurial decision making in terms of principles and values. And one thing that we talked about specifically in sales. So there's obviously there's you could say there's two types of cultures. One in the sense where in the company, one of the most important things is just reaching your quota. And in sales, it's very easy to get wrapped up in the numbers and making sure that you're delivering on your quota and getting it done. Sometimes it's at the expense of your morals or your values at the company or just ethics in general. So I'm wondering, have you ever seen this or how do you ensure that you make sure your team is just absolutely making the moral decision, the right decision, but also being the most productive and um, best, best deliver um, at their, at sales. It is such an insightful question. Um, and I really believe that you will do better in sales if you have black and white boundaries around mm. integrity, period. Yeah. Um, so in fact, one of the ways that you can live that as a sales leader is when you hear um, an account executive propose your premium product, but it's to a customer who, who doesn't need a particularly sophisticated version of your product. Like when you feel like there's some misalignment but you could earn more money from that. Um, You ask, you know, why specifically this product and you know, how would, how would their business look different if they ended up going one tier lower and being willing to make the sacrifice yourself for a short-term revenue and say, you know what? I really think the better fit 
is the lower end product, um, allows you to lead by example and gives people permission to in turn, just really follow their instincts and do the right thing by the customer. And I completely believe in karma, um, not just in a spiritual way, but you know, a company is nothing beyond its reputation across customers and the world is really small and it is very easy um, for customers to share info with one another and, and to understand when they've been upsold. Mm-hmm. So you just, you really have to trust that taking a short term loss is always worth the long term gain. Mm-hmm. And as you're thinking as a leader about whom to promote and what to create positive reinforcement around more broadly and more publicly across the team, you want to reinforce people who did right by their customer, not mm-hmm. people who secured the biggest, fanciest deal but people who um, navigated the journey in the most customer-centric way. Yeah, I think that... I I really, really don't believe... um, I don't believe sales has to be a profession or or really should be a profession at all where your um, morals or integrity are compromised at all. If If you go back to what we were saying earlier, which is if you're selling something that you think someone would be crazy not to buy. Like it is, it is a detriment to their business not to use it, which is how I feel about Slack a hundred percent for every company with knowledge workers under the sun. Then you truly have to believe that they're going to unlock more value by paying for it than they would by doing something else. And then it kind of addresses your issue from earlier. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's a very important message that you just said. So I think that's great. And okay, two more questions before we get to more fun ones. But I've heard that there's definitely less, definitely a gap in female leaders in sales compared to males. And I'm sure it is closing um, since previous years. But I am wondering why you think that is and what can you do to ensure to kind of close that gap? I don't know why that is. And I do see the gap. Um, closing slowly but surely, and I feel really intent on being part of uh, of helping close that. Yeah. So, if there are any women out there listening or watching who are considering a career in sales, I would love to talk to you about it. Um, I think it it plays well to um, some of the the skills that are very naturally nurtured for women. Um, so, I'm, I'm completely generalizing here, yeah. but I I know I as a woman have been taught to be um, you know, a really good listener and to hold back from interrupting from people and to try to connect with where people are and, mm-hmm. and act upon that empathy. And frankly, those are all the traits that serve you really well in sales and over time in management and leadership. So I, I think it plays really well, um, to women. I think, um, I think we have fewer chances to face rejection, you know, mm-hmm. historically, the guy asks the girl out. So, you know, if you're a guy and you've asked six different girls out over the course of your 20s and you've heard no and you know how to let it roll off your back, well, maybe you're okay with rejection. Yeah. And sales requires a lot of resiliency and comfort with rejection. And so maybe we just have to practice putting ourselves out there and addressing fear of failure and, you know, asking someone out yeah. or doing other things where no is a very fair answer and feeling what it's like to let that roll off our back and, and seeing how great it is to actually hear a yes when you don't expect it. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there are plenty of ways that we can practice. And, um, and I think seeing more women um, enter into leadership roles mm-hmm. will um, impact the number of women who enter sales in the first place. Cause it's just, it's important to be able to visualize someone who looks and acts and behaves like yourself. Yeah. And, um, and then it's important for all of us to stick together and, and help us navigate one another's careers. Yeah. I think that's such a great, I actually didn't think about that. The difference of boys versus girls and maybe boys are used to rejection more because it's true. I think even, even when applying to jobs, you see a lot of girls, I've, I've read about this, but a lot of girls, when they see a whole list of skills that they need or requirements and they don't have a couple, they're like, oh, okay, I guess it's not for me. Whereas boys are just like, oh, who knows? Like, we'll see what happens and I can just learn on the job. But I think, I think there should be that, that change or change of mindset almost for females to be like, look, worst case, I get a no. That's kind of how I am when I reach out to these 
females. I'm just like, why not? Worst case, they, they don't reply. And I'm like, it's okay. <laughs> so I think that's very true. Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering. And yeah, go that's ahead. my advice to anyone, by the way. Like, let's say you've already kicked off your career and there's a management opening. And you already know the objections that you're going to get, which is you need to have sold X amount first, or you don't quite have enough experience for the management role. My advice to all people who I don't think are strong Mm self-advocates is go for it. Well, the first question is, are you okay with rejection? And over time, I think that they can get comfortable saying, okay, yeah, it wouldn't be so bad if I get rejected. Yeah. And then I always say, listen, it's going to be a great use of my time and anyone else on the hiring panel's time to hear you tell your story. Yeah. And if nothing else, it's going to set you up better to get the role next time when you really feel ready. So why not do it? When, like, Even if you're not quite there yet, take the at-bat and practice yeah. and everybody wins. Yeah. So before we finish, I really, really want you to talk about, I know you're a big believer in goal setting. And you've used uh-huh. this in navigating your career path. So, yeah, tell me a little bit more about your process and goal setting and what it looks like and, yeah, just in general, just for others to use. Sure. Yeah, I really believe in goal setting um, for a number of reasons. I think the data supports that goal setting can play a really important role in your career and specifically writing down your notes uh, about your goals. So there is, um, I think there was a study at Harvard Business School that said that 3% of people within a graduating class had written down their goals. And that 3% um, ended up making more money over the course of a 10-year span than the combination of the remaining 97% of people in that class. And I say this not to emphasize the importance of money and happiness, because I think those two are pretty decoupled, frankly. But it is an indicator that putting something down in writing makes it that much more likely that you are um, going to achieve it. Like it almost adds a level of personal accountability. And then I think mm. you up that accountability when you find a partner in crime to share it with. Mm. And so, and that's actually what ended up inspiring my journey to business school. I had a meeting with an exec coach when I was at HubSpot and um, we were going to do an annual goals review and I hadn't thought through goals and I thought maybe business school should be on there. And so I shared that with him and I wrote it down and lo and behold, like that, that's what, that's what kicked off my journey to applying to business school. And my goal was not even getting accepted. My goal was to be extremely proud of the effort that I put in to applying, like feeling like I didn't leave anything on the table because I trusted, you know, there's an element of luck and fate and other things involved there. And I'm so, so grateful for that. So my suggestion would be, um, think, think short and medium term about what your goals are. Be open to that being, uh, an evolving process, write down both. Um, you can, um, do that one to two times a year and you can pair that with, you know, new year's Mm. or like a particular date or something that bakes in the tradition Mm. and then find someone that you can share it with to make it that much more likely that it will, um, that it'll come to fruition And if nothing else, you're going to have this amazing, um, this, this amazing documentation of how you've thought through your, your personal and your professional life over the course of years, which I think will serve you really well. Yeah, I think that's great. I think I agree. A lot of people I've talked to talk about goal setting and how writing them down is that much more important. And it's almost like putting it into the universe. Like I'm big into just like, once it's out there, then it's even more so you have to be like, okay. This is what, these are the steps I need to get there. So I love that. I think it's, I think it's so valuable. Okay. I took it to a crazy level when I, when I first learned about this, yeah. um, it was through one of my first bosses and mentors, Pete Caputa at HubSpot. And I painted a full wall within my living room with chalkboard paint, which was trendy at the time. <laughs> and I, um, and I wrote down my goals, personal and professional in chalk on the living room wall, which is like taking it one step too far, frankly, but everyone who walked in my house (laughs) would basically have this conversation with me about them. And it really held me accountable to achieving a number of those. So, you know, that's one end of the extreme writing it down in a moleskin is, is the other side of it. Oh my. So did you have it up there for how long? I had it up. I have a photo of it. Um, and then, uh, 
and I haven't done that since, but mm-hmm. I, I do still, I, I do still put pen to paper. That's so cool. That's awesome. So, okay. Final questions. What is a passion or hobby that you have, Danny, that's unrelated to your work? Hmm. Well, I kind of hinted at this earlier. Um, I'm very passionate about helping people address mental health. So mm-hmm. that's where a lot of my volunteer work yeah. um, lies. And, and that's where we focus on any sort of you know, charitable investments. Yeah. Um, I want to, I, I want to help people think about seeking health as a brag worthy um, type of initiative as opposed to one that um, involves stigma. So I mentioned an executive coach earlier. I think that's gaining some steam. Yeah. And I think people, the more sounding boards we have, the more people who hold up mirrors to our faces and make us look internally as opposed to, you know, blaming any of, the, any of our circumstances on the external world, you know, the better we show up as, as colleagues, as partners to our spouses yeah. and as individuals. So I feel really strongly about that, um, yeah. and I, I try to play that role even informally to, to anyone in my social world or in my family who craves it. Yeah, I think I think that's and it's even more more pertinent today in, with coronavirus and just having that connection. I think that personal connection is so important. So I love that. I really do. I'm also pretty passionate about mental health and how it's very very relevant in a lot of industries, which is sad, but it's true. So I think it's great. Okay. Well, more on a positive note, what is a fun or weird talent that you have that no one else really knows about? And so I'll go first. Mm -hmm. So I got a blueberry and I could throw blueberries into my mouth. Okay. So here we go. (laughs) Let's see. Okay. There we go. (laughs) <laughs> Bravo! Thank you, thank you. Did thank you practice? I've been practicing all my life. No, I've been doing. I do this at the end of every show, and so far it's been so great. Beginning, I did a little failure rounds, but it's totally fine, and now we're doing well. See, like this is what I mean. You took a bold risk. <laughs> you put yourself out there. You could have failed, but here you go. Exactly. You're ready to fail. Exactly. Um. <sighs> Okay, I have one close to your blueberry one. Cool. Um, I was going to say, I think my superpower is my memory, mm. and often that is that is pointlessly applied. Like it's not like I've memorized all historical facts and I can get an A plus on every test. Yeah. Um, but in terms of like my social and more nuanced memory, I have a catalog of everything under the sun there, which I think in sales makes people feel. Um, special and remembered and cared for, which yeah. is really nice. Um, but my 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 skill akin to the blueberry is I think I saw on your wrist you have a rubber band. Yeah. Yes. So in my family, there is a sport where someone stands on completely the other side of the room and you hold up your hand and I can flick my rubber hair band um, and hit the target, I would mm-hmm. say, nine out of ten times across a medium sized room wow. and I cannot prove that cause I'm alone right now. <laughs> Please take my word for it. I will. Um, I'll take your word. So skill. you must be, have you ever tried like archery or some, something in. I did do archery at camp. I can't say I was amazing at that. <laughs> it's really, it's the it's just, pointer finger yeah. and the resistance. Oh. Like yes. Yeah. I, I, I like doing that too. It's good. And <laughs> actually the memory thing I'm, I'm weird in terms of memory. People, I know people's birthday that I haven't even, like, friends of mine since I was, like, five years old. I know their birthday. It's very weird. Like, once they say it to me once, I have it in my mind. I don't know. Oh, my gosh. I'm in – I just had a friend from elementary school text me saying, it's it's April 24th. Whose birthday is it today? (laughs) So I'm totally right there with you. My husband thinks I'm I'm wasting space in my brain that could be used for something more productive. Yeah. But – I think um, I think it is is very helpful mm. and and you know comes out in unexpectedly yeah. delightful ways. Very useful. I feel the same. Yeah, I do for sure. <laughs> well, Danny, I just have to say it's been so fun and I've learned a lot and it's so great to have someone a leader in sales because I haven't talked to someone in sales so it's been very interesting and 
Yeah, just thank you so much for coming on the show. I've loved it. 